Amy Kruger. Um, so uh, if you again, uh, we, we welcome you. We are uh, NAMI Central Texas and we're bringing you Mind Matters at Home. My name is Karen Reynas. I'm the Executive Director for NAMI Central Texas and I'm delighted to welcome Penny Kruger for today's Mind Matters at Home in which we talk about finding balance, regulating emotions with DBT. Penny, delighted to have you. I'm going to turn it over to you and then I will pop in as needed whenever there's questions. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Karen. Hi, I'm Penny Kruger. I am going to need to see, let's see, Karen, am I, where my slides are here. Um, do you look at Christina's going to be okay. putting those on for you. So oh, takes, sometimes the technology takes a little bit of time, but she's going to be switching those over to your screen. Okay, anybody that knows me knows the technology is not my forte. So good morning, everybody. I am Penny Kruger, and I am here today to talk to you guys about just an overview of DBT and what DBT has to offer. They also wanted me to compare DBT a little bit to standard CBT, so people kind of get a sense of what the differences are. That's certainly a common question that I hear from people. Um, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about what brought me to DBT. I know... Um, um, uh, some of you may know that I am one of the directors for Austin DBT Associates, which is an outpatient practice that provides outpatient adherent DBT for adults and adolescents. But I really want to speak more to one of my um, hats that's near and dear to me, which is with Ascension uh, Seat and Behavioral Health. Um, I am the clinical lead for the adult DBT intensive outpatient program that I started about it's about 14 or 15 years ago now. Um, and they were the first DBT intensive outpatient program in Austin, Texas. And I feel very proud about that because I, don't, I wouldn't have been able to do that without the support from Ascension Seton. And I also felt really proud of the fact that not only um, were we able to offer DBT for the first time um, to the community, but uh, Seton has always done such a lovely job of, you know, being able to offer it to people with all types of insurance and Medicare and also offering financial assistance as needed. So felt like it was offered to everyone to have a chance um, to be a part of the DBT intensive outpatient programming there. Um, I, I want to say a little bit that when I first started um, at Seton, I was doing uh, the traditional CBT intensive outpatient group at that time. And one of the things that I noticed is that we tended to have a subset of uh, clients who were tended to fall out of group. They were having trouble sort of tolerating the process. They were having trouble um, being able to stay in the group because of the severity of their dysregulation. They sometimes may have been having temper outbursts um, and just difficulty being able to complete the treatment. And that was when I first started thinking about wanting to take a look at DBT. I had had a previous exposure earlier in my life um, working at a complex trauma unit in New Orleans. And we had patients who were having difficulty living outside of the hospital. They kept returning to the hospital frequently due to suicide attempts and self-injury. And that was when Marsha Linehan had first come out with her manual in the early 90s. And so that was my first exposure to DBT. Um, but at that point, I wasn't practicing. And so Seton allowed me the opportunity to to go get some training and to start the first DBT intensive outpatient group to see how it goes. And from there today we have, I think we have about uh, 12 adult intensive outpatient groups. Um, and so we serve a wide, uh, uh, a wide portion of the, of the population in Austin. Um, I will speak a little bit during my uh, presentation today around some of the other uh, subspecialties as well with DBT. Thank you, Penny. I just, yeah. I'm going to interrupt real quick to let you know that it sounds like um, in order to be able to share now your screen, um, you're going to need to click on new share on your Zoom panel so that you'll be able to show your slides. Okay, continue, share. Is that there you go. All right, awesome. Awesome. Okay, everybody, let's see. Ah, I don't see my, oh, here they are. Okay. 
All right, so what is DBT? So DBT, right, just to let everybody know, right before we start this, is a CBT-based treatment. Um, it was called part of the third wave of CBT. And basically what it did was it extended, right, the, the cognitive change strategies that um, Aaron Beck had brought to us with CBT and added on to that elements of core mindfulness and dialectics, which is what Marsha Linehan brought from her practice of Zen mindfulness. And I'll speak a little bit more to that. But the focus is on relentless problem solving with an attitude of acceptance. The priority is to help the client to build a life worth living. This really spoke to me with DBT because um, one of the things that I didn't want to feel like we were doing in DBT was just trying to convince people to not commit suicide, right? That's a very important piece. But on the other side of that, we wanted to make sure that they were developing the skills to be able to build a life, right? Because that's an important part of treatment to be able to move into the next stage. And this is one of Marsha Linehan's quotes from her recent memoir. You know what you need in life, but you don't know how to get what you want. Your problem is you might have good motives, but you don't have good skills. So in DBT, we take great pride in that we're not interpreting a client's motivation around how they're doing in treatment. Uh, we are, we, we truly believe that our clients do not want to be miserable and that they want to get out of hell. And at the same time, we have to get them to learn skills to be able to do that. And so two fundamental assumptions in DBT that I want to share. Um, and again, um, an experienced DBT clinician believes these assumptions down into the depths of our soul. Our clients did not cause all of their problems and they have to solve them anyway. And our clients are doing the best that they can and that they have to do better, try harder, and be more motivated. So you see at the, at the beginning here, there, is, there are dialectics woven throughout the process around validation of how true and accurate the depths of suffering is for our clients, and that we have to get them to make changes so that they can build a life that they want to live. I do just want to say as well that as far as the core mindfulness piece, you know, for those of you that are familiar with John Kabat-Zinn, you know, he, he was one of the first people, I think, to really bring that practice of mindfulness into sort of Western medicine. But what Marsha Linehan did is she brought it into psychotherapy, and it's a, it's a pretty big buzzword now, but she was the one that really uh, created some uh, behavioral extrapolations, I mean, some behavioral skills that were taken from the practice of, of meditation and made them, in my opinion, just user-friendly for all of us to be able to think about practicing in our day-to-day -day business of living, regardless of if we had a meditation practice. Um, let's see. So why consider using DBT? So DBT is, the research shows that it's an effective treatment for reducing suicidal and parasuicidal behavior, for reducing inpatient treatment stays, and reducing treatment dropout. So this is what DBT was built for, and I'll talk a little bit more about how it's been extrapolated again to treat a lot of other things, but this is what it was made for. And this is where the data, the research is really geared towards showing its effectiveness. DBT was initially developed to treat borderline behavioral patterns such as temper outbursts and parasuicidal behaviors that often become therapy interfering or at worst therapy destroying. Um, again, these behaviors can also be linked to a lot of other diagnoses outside of just BPD, but this is what it was initially built for. And one of the things that was really interesting about Marsha Linehan is again, she was trying to build a treatment that at the time was considered to address some of the most difficult um, behaviors and diagnoses in, in, in therapy. And something that a lot of clinicians, frankly, were avoiding, um, even though that's what we do. So she was, I think, uh, really 
uh, courageous and brave in where she went. And I know that for those of you who have read her recent memoir, you get a greater understanding of, of why she went down that path. So DBT also helps clients that have often failed other treatments and who are feeling hopeless about future treatment. So many of our clients, when they come to us in DBT, have done a lot of other treatments and um, are often feeling like they're not making progress, which is one of the things that we do in DBT. And again, not, it is not meant to be a judgment in regards to why somebody's not making progress in treatment. DBT offers an opportunity to use non-judgmental behavioral language to put words on therapy interfering behaviors. And DBT definitely levels the playing field in that we are focused on um, therapy interfering behaviors for both the client and the therapist, right? Because we bring our own, our own biases into the treatment as well. DBT is a structured treatment which provides an effective container for both client and therapists to stay on course as opposed to responding to the crisis of the week. So, when our clients are moving in and there is, a, there is a part of our dialectical dilemmas that's actually called unrelenting crisis. And one of the things that can actually increase hopelessness for some of our clients are when the clinician is only responding to trying to put out a fire each week. And honestly, many of our clients feel that way as well when they feel like they're only putting out fires and not feeling like they're moving forward and making progress. So the structure of the treatment is meant to be a container, not just for the client, but for the therapist as well. And last, DBT utilizes the, team, tr the treatment team to provide support to the therapist and to help manage um, uh, their own therapy interfering behaviors. So it is really important to understand that one of the things I truly appreciate about DBT is that it really holds clinicians accountable as well, right? Like both clients and therapists can get demoralized in treatment when things aren't going as we planned. And it's really important for both to have their support and also to help us be able to stay on track with that. And pause and just make sure there's no questions. Okay, so what is the difference between CBT and DBT? Um, again, a common question I hear from providers and from clients alike. Honestly, what it is is DBT has built on to all the wonderful work that Aaron Beck started. One of the primary differences though is that CBT tends to be a shorter, more time-limited therapy it also tends to only focus on, there, there are behavioral strategies, but its primary focus is on changing faulty thinking, being able to identify distortions. One of the things, change your thoughts, right? Change your life. And for when I was doing the CBT group initially, when I thought about starting the DBT program, one of the things that kept happening was that for many of my clients, the changing their cognitions um, part was felt really invalidating for them. Um, many of them, of course, at least 75% of our patients have had a trauma history and the idea of just doing the cognitive restructuring that that would somehow change their suffering just really didn't resonate with some of them very well. And so it ended up feeling like an invalidation. And DBT just kind of picked up and built on what Aaron Beck had already done. Marsha Linehan built in that other side of the dialectic of acceptance and change, right? Which is what she brings in from Zen Buddhism. This idea of focusing on skills for practicing, accepting reality as it is, which honestly, that's also a really difficult thing for all of us to practice. It's not that that's any easier. It's just that it holds both sides. It's always holding the dialectic of acceptance and change, whereas CBT is a bit more just a change strategy. The other thing is that CBD, CBT, CBD, CBT also focuses on treating 
primarily one issue at a time. And that was another problem that was coming up in treatment. Many of our clients that come to us in DBT um, have multiple diagnoses and multiple behavioral targets. And it can get pretty confusing about what to pay attention to so that we stay centered on where the treatment is going. And DBT is built for that. It's built for addressing multiple diagnoses and multiple behavioral targets. And I'll talk a little bit more how we prioritize those targets so that we can maintain focus during the treatment. Penny, if you don't mind, um, just a real quick, uh, just uh, a, a comment from someone um, that came in is just, which makes me think that just, uh, I think folks may be getting a little bit lost in all of the nuances of just remembering that, because um, somebody asked me if this was for clinicians or individuals. Yes. And so as a clinician, I know, and, and I would imagine you do a lot of training for clinicians as well, but it may be helpful to slow down and remember and just help a little bit with the language in terms of, for those of us that all of this is very new. Um, so just keeping that in mind. Let me, let me do something a little bit, Karen, if it's possible. Let me stop share. Okay. And what might be helpful is for me to talk just a little bit about just in general about what we're doing instead of using the slides around that. So, so let me, let me talk a little bit just about, again, I was talking about the comparison with CBT. Okay. But let's just talk about a little bit what might bring somebody to dialectical behavior therapy. What might make, they might be deciding if dialectical behavior therapy is their good fit. The important thing that I just want to make note of is that DBT, even though it was initially developed for working with borderline personality disorder, um, it has also been shown to be effective, right, with other things such as bipolar one and bipolar type two, um, binge purge disorders, substance, uh, binge substance abuse, um, treatment resistant depression, things of that nature. And so, when, when, I, when I tell people when they call me about DBT and they say, you know, how do I know if this is, would be a helpful treatment to me? In a nutshell, what I tell them is that DBT was built for helping people that are struggling with severe emotional dysregulation, okay, with being able to manage impulsive behavioral patterns that are basically causing fallout in their life. And that may be, that could be around life-threatening targets or self-injurious kind of targets, or it might be about relationships, right? Having a lot of sort of interpersonal chaos in relationships. Um, for many of our clients, I think Marsha Linehan really, um, she really nailed it with uh, the words she used, which is that for many of our clients, it might feel like they are uh, sort of an emotional burn victim that doesn't have an emotional skin, meaning that the interpersonal world always feels like a big sort of ouch, um, and they're having a hard time with that, and it's causing other issues for them. Um, so these are these are some of the reasons that bring people to DBT. And um, the other one is when, I think the other big reason I see is when people are feeling really kind of hopeless about feeling like they've done a lot of other treatment and they just feel like they're not making progress. And so again, DBT can be helpful in um, helping them maybe identify some of the things that are interfere with them, interfering with them making progress in treatment. Again, without having to blame the client, right? But just to observe some of the things that could come up for any of us when we're in treatment. I hope right. that- Thank you. Well, I think, I think so. And before you go back to the slides, just real quick, another question that came up that I thought I'd ask you about. Does CBT, so the cognitive behavioral therapy or DBT, work with patients who have anisognosia? And is that, are you familiar with that phrasing? Not. Um, it is a, it is, anisognosia is sort of a, uh, an amnesia to your illness. And we often find that people who live with serious mental illness often experience it. So there is this sense that there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm not sick. Um, so, um, yeah, so I haven't put that word, I haven't utilized that language with it. But yes, honestly, uh, that, is, that is something that we um, absolutely would do a lot of good work with because um, it's not uncommon for um, uh, 
many of our clients to come because their families are asking them to come because the families are experiencing fallout in their family system um, or maybe there's been a lot of recurrent crises but the client themselves feel like there's not a problem to solve and so there's a reason and i'll talk about the stages of treatment that when they come to dbt the first stage is pre-treatment and the reason that we call it pre-treatment is because we spend a lot of time working on uh, issues related to motivation um, and helping clients to identify the targets that not only they're willing to work on, but also the ones that are causing the most fallout. And that can be a process as opposed to, I think in CBT, I think that um, motivational issues and being stuck in treatment is kind of the exception as opposed to the norm. I think in DBT, we have an expectation that that's some work that we're gonna need to do with clients on the front end. A lot of times in DBT, I feel like we're helping clients to get ready for a treatment as well. So, you know, getting them treatment ready or getting them group ready. And so that's a process. Does that answer the question, Karen? Yes, I think so. Okay. And, and just so you know, people were enjoying the slides, so don't feel like you can't go back to those because I think those were very informative too. I will, I will. I just wanted to make sure I was kind of connecting with everybody, kind of where you were. Um, I really hate not being able to see all your faces and to kind of gauge, um, you know, what, what you're, you're taking from this or not. But so I appreciate the feedback. So keep, keep bringing it to me. Um, let me see. Now i got to go back to the slides here. Um, ah, okay. Um, I'm going to go. Okay. I already spoke to this kind of speaking to, again, DBT is an effective treatment for helping to reduce. And when I say targets, again, that might be more clinical jargon, right? Targets are the, um, the observable sort of behavioral uh, things that we help clients identify that are really causing some of the most pain and suffering for them. And I take that back. They don't always have to be observable, right? Because some of our targets might be internal, right? Like things like um, obsessive rumination, right? Or targets can be what we call external, which are things that are easier to obviously quantify, like things like self-injury, right? Or um, suicidal behaviors or gestures. Um, one of the more internal ones, of course, that we're always following and measuring is suicidal ideation. Um, so DBT was first was the first treatment to provide hope for helping those who suffer with BPD and support for the clinicians who are working with them. And so- Peggy, it, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're not seeing your slides at the moment. Oh. Yeah, I think you just have to go back to sharing. I'm sorry. Let's see. Okay, hold on. Okay. Okay. Uh, share. Ah, the joys of technology, right? There we go. Oh, no. Yeah, you just got to show the slides instead. There you go. There you go. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. Um, okay, so let's talk about this. So in DBT, for those of you who are wondering what the treatment looks like and what to expect if you were to come, one of the things that's important to understand that's a little bit different than other therapies is that, um, again, the treatment targets, they must be agreed upon, but there, there is a hierarchy to what we pay attention to, meaning that um, the highest level targets for somebody that are life-threatening, right, are the things that are non-negotiable in DBT. So you can see where the treatment would be a little bit more structured, but our belief, and again, Marsha Linehan will say this, that, right, that treatment is a moot point if the client is not alive. So we're pretty um, fierce about making sure that that target is our highest priority 
if it's on the table. And I do want to be clear that everybody that comes to DBT, that's not necessarily their highest target. For some of our clients, they might really just be struggling with a lot of impulsive behaviors that are interfering with the quality of their life. And I'll speak a little bit to that as I get to it. So the next part is related to um, therapy interfering targets that refer again to both client and therapist. And the reason that this is a high level target is because it's meant to reduce premature termination of therapy. So let me explain what that means, right? Premature termination, right? So um, in DBT, one of the things that we really target are clients that might have a high dropout rate in therapy. There really is um, like a 50% dropout rate period um, across the board for a lot of therapies, but with our clients, many of them have uh, either disrupted previous treatments uh, or feel like uh, they, may, they themselves may have been fired from the treatment. So we target that as a really important one so that we can cope ahead, right, which is a, a statement we use a lot in DBT, that we're coping ahead for things that might be a problem because again, we want to maintain the long term treatment and help our client get where they need to go. The other piece is uh, the last is quality of life targets, which are basically we put those in order based on how much they're impacting the quality of our client's life. So some examples of these might be, um, you know, temper outbursts or intense interpersonal conflict, right, with family or at work uh, that's maybe making it difficult to sustain employment. Um, looking at things like uh, eating disordered behaviors or uh, binge substance abuse um, uh, or things of this nature that, again, are causing fallout for the client and interfering with their quality of life. So, it's a little bit different and I think what people are typically used to when they go to a therapist and uh, it's more process oriented and maybe focused a little bit more on uh, family of origin issues or kind of just processing whatever is going on for the client that week. In DBT, um, we are holding a structure around what we're trying to help our clients reduce in their life, the behaviors that we feel like will help them move closer to the quality of life that they are wanting. Okay. So dialectical thinking, what does that mean, right? So dialectics are a synthesis um, of holding two things that seem opposite and holding them both at the same time to create a both and, right? The primary dialectic in DBT acceptance of oneself and one's situation in life and embracing change towards a better life, which is a dialectic of acceptance and change. Again, this is woven throughout the whole treatment. Um, and it's one that we play close, that we pay close attention to as DBT clinicians, because sometimes the clinician, we recognize that sometimes we might be pushing our client too much towards change, right? or that we might be only relying on validation and not doing enough shaping towards change. So this is one of the things that we pay close attention to on our treatment teams. There are three states of mind that we talk about in DBT uh, that we all possess, right? Reasonable mind, this is what Marshall Linehan calls it. I really call it logical mind, which is that idea of, you know, the things that are more factual, right? Just checking the facts, the things we need to kind of like build a bridge or balance our checkbook, right? And then on the other side is emotion mind. And emotion mind, again, um, many of my clients might feel like emotion mind is where they live most of the time, but honestly, emotion mind, we're also talking about the value of emotion mind and how much that's the place, right, where uh, it brings us together in connection with other people. It helps with creativity and all the things that basically, I think, make us a better human race. So both of these states of mind are really important. And the goal in DBT when we're practicing and learning skills is to be able to access our wise mind. And 
I think, and I often get this feedback, you know, when we have uh, people come observe our groups like residents or nursing students or when, um, you know, we've taught DBT in the schools is that one of the things I hear all the time is that really everybody needs these skills and it's, and it is true. I mean, these are skills for all of us to practice. And so the idea of being able to practice accessing my wise mind so that I can hold both the validation around my emotional experience right and being able to check the facts so that i can find the most effective way to respond right is the goal any questions about that Ooh, what did i do there ah oh i just put this slide in i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to skip over it though because i think it's going to not be helpful today. Um, let me talk a little bit about the four modules. So in DBT, there are four primary uh, skills modules and they have a ton of skills underneath each, right? But I wanna speak a little bit to the function of each one, okay? And so core mindfulness skills are uh, there to help increase awareness to being in the present moment, which I think is something we talk about a lot now because mindfulness has definitely become woven throughout our, our society. Um, reducing cognitive and emotional confusion. So kind of speaking a little bit to what you were talking about earlier, this idea of um, confusion about the self, self-identity, or just struggling for folks that struggle with dissociation, okay? and learning to observe oneself and one's behavior with a little bit more distance. This is how we begin to move more into being able to cultivate and be in line with our wise mind goals. All right. Distress tolerance. So let me just say in a nutshell, right, like distress tolerance are typically some of the favorite skills in DBT. And these are about skills for um, self-soothing and distraction that are basically about how to survive a crisis without making it worse. Being able to reduce the amount of fallout in relationships and in the environment. And in the environment, what I mean is referring to like our jobs or our communities or our family systems. And that, because one of the things that really increases people's hopelessness right, is when they feel like they are having to expend a lot of energy, having to clean up situations or having to always make repairs after the fallout of perhaps engaging in a, a, a temper outbursts or moving into a crisis situation. And so our goal is to help our clients be able to tolerate reality as it is, which is right life on life's terms, radical acceptance of what is, um, so that they will be able to hold longer and delay impulsive action that again causes a lot of shame on the back end. The goal that we work for with our clients is work is working to reduce the intensity, frequency, and duration of more self-destructive behaviors. Okay. So the next set are emotion regulation. Emotion regulation is the other module that we go to. And I always say like emotion regulation is kind of like a little bit more of a higher level practice than distress tolerance. I think when most of our clients, when they start in DBT, a lot of work is gonna be focused on distress tolerance, right? Trying to, again, reduce the amount of crises going on in, in our lives. But when we move on to emotion regulation, the idea is to begin to have more language and to be able to more accurately identify not only uh, some of the emotions that we're experiencing but also to help reduce the intensity. So it's really important to understand that emotion regulation is not about making negative emotions go away, but about helping feel like we can manage or modulate the intensity or the duration of emotions. And you know, I really love that Marshall Linehan paid attention to that that has to do with both positive and negative emotions. It's not just about reducing negative emotions. Sometimes, right, we can relate to that we're trying to also regulate the, the intensity of more positive experiences, maybe around new attraction with people, new love relationships, and things like that. So she, she definitely always holds the both and there. 
And the idea is to be able to learn to ride the wave of the emotions that are more specific to what we're experiencing as opposed to moving into our more global secondary emotions. And I know that this may be language that everybody's obviously not familiar with at this point. So I'll just do a, a quick teach is that primary emotions are ones that are a little bit more, um, they are congruent, right? They are specific to what is happening right now. So the, whatever I'm having trouble tolerating, it matches what's happening. But for all of us, what tends to happen is after we experience that primary emotion, it kind of segues through our lens of our, of our life experiences, right? And it moves into what we call a secondary emotion, which is a lot more global. It tends to be a lot more related to hopeless despair, and it relates to kind of all of our past experiences and judgments about kind of how we've done things in life. And so that's, in emotion regulation, we're really trying to pay attention to to teaching skills that will help reduce moving into that more global um, emotional response. Because that's one of the things that tends to increase not only hopelessness, but passive or active suicidal ideation for people. Okay. The last one is interpersonal effectiveness. This is kind of my favorite area because again, like I said, if you think about it, um, for many people, a primary prompting event that comes up for many of our clients in DBT is usually an interpersonal conflict, whether that's with partners or friends or family members. There can be such a high sensitivity to real or perceived um, criticism or invalidation, right? That this is a really painful part for them. And so learning to be able to practice interpersonal effectiveness um, is a really important part of the treatment. And we spend a lot of time in this arena and we do a lot of role play to help bring it to life and to help encourage practice in their real life. And so um, being able to increase feelings of mastery about being able to problem solve, um, decreasing feelings of hopelessness about being able to manage relationships, Right? Remember, at the end of the day, we're all trying to create healthier attachments. And so interpersonal skills are a really important piece to being able to make and maintain these attachments so that we can continue to create healthy intimacy. So increasing awareness of the goal of the interaction and also the other piece, right? Practicing tolerating not getting what we want. Right? That's a big piece for all of us. Having to cope ahead for not getting what we want is something that, you know, again, I think that's something that we all have to practice every day. Um, increase awareness of reciprocity. And so, again, that word is about being able to practice not only wanting more validation from the people in my life, but making sure I'm learning the skills to validate the people that are around me and also increasing my awareness of other people's emotions as well as my own, right? That exchange of energy and relationships that is a really important piece to being able to maintain longer term connections. Okay, does anybody have a question about all that? I'm gonna talk a little bit more, but um, about any of those four modules. I'm not seeing any questions just yet, Penny. Okay, good. All right. So I will go ahead. So what happens when you are considering thinking about DBT treatment? Okay. And I put up here some of the referral resources. There are different levels of care, and I kind of want to explain what they look like in case, again, you've either had a family member in treatment, you'd like to refer a family member for treatment, or you yourself are thinking about treatment. So one of the things is that it, we, have an, we have an adult at Seton Behavioral Health, we actually have an adult DBT PHP program. And we have an adult DBT IOP. I also put RODBT and DBT SUD. I'll do a little blurb about that, but I didn't want to add too much. Um, 
So basically what that means is that when they go to one of these higher levels of care, our PHP is a day program, which is about nine to three o'clock and our intensive outpatient programs are four days a week for three hours a day and those last for five weeks. And what I tell folks when they're going to that level of care to access DBT is that it's kind of like getting a DBT booster shot, right? You're gonna get a lot of DBT material um, at one time, um, but it can be a really helpful way to start um, at your DBT experience because at that point when you're needing an intensive outpatient level of care usually that's because there has perhaps been a recent crisis perhaps somebody is stepping down from the hospital or perhaps somebody's trying to avoid a hospitalization so it's really honestly very effective to be able to access these lower levels of care um, but when you utilize the PHP or the IOP the goal there is to provide structure, right? It's to provide a structure and a container um, for people to be able to get uh, the DBT skills, but also to have the structure around them on a daily basis. Sometimes when people are also taking like a leave of absence perhaps from their job um, because of their mood symptoms, they might also utilize the structure of an intensive outpatient setting. I also wanted to note on here that at Dell Children's Hospital that we also have an adolescent DBT IOP as well. And so, sorry, Pe oh, sorry, Penny, there was a question that came through. Someone asked if you could go back to the interpersonal effectiveness and goals. And the question that they have is, how can a person with mental health, let's see, how can a person with mental health recognize their goals? Ah. That's a great question. So what happens is, is in DBT, one of the things that we utilize, one of the tools that we utilize quite extensively in individual treatment um, uh, are behavior chains. And so one of the things that when uh, somebody is coming in and they're talking about what we call as a prompting event, which is basically something that may have caused a lot of emotional fallout for our client, we're having them work through with the therapist or in the group, right? Writing out what's called a behavior chain so that we can kind of look at all the pieces and what Marshall Linehan would say is that all these pieces of the behavior chain, like kind of what happened, our interpretations, our emotional experience, all go into a full system emotional response. And so when we're doing these behavior chains over time and also kind of hearing kind of what's falling apart for our client in their environment, we start to make some observations in terms of what might be some of the specific target behaviors that are breaking down the interaction for our client. So honestly, you know, I feel like a lot of times when I'm doing these that people, the, the content of what my client is trying to communicate to the environment is typically right on, like it's really valid. Um, and what I'm giving them feedback on is perhaps the intensity of the communication or the timing of the communication, or perhaps, again, how they respond once they get a response from the environment. So we're going through a step-by-step, -step, again, behavioral analysis, because it's a behavioral therapy. Um, so um, we're going through a step-by-step -step analysis so that we can take a look at where are the links where it kind of fell apart. Again, it's a very collaborative experience, um, you know, it, with the therapist and the, and the client to be able to work on this together to identify these things. Um, I might make an observation though for my client if they are not uh, seeing anything, I might make some observations about what I suspect might be happening, um, but leaving enough room for them to give me feedback and frankly, to be able to tell me um, if I'm wrong, you know, if I'm missing it. Does that help? I'm not hearing otherwise, so I'm thinking so. So thank you, that was a great answer. I, I will tell you too that there are three primary goals for all of us in interactions, which are what we call objective effectiveness, which is about basically that we'd all like to get what we want, right? We'd all like to get what we are asking for. The second one is being able to maintain the relationship, 
All right, that's another big goal. We'd like to be able to ask for what we want and still feel like we maintained the relationship and didn't kind of blow up the bridge. And then the last one is maintaining self-respect. So all three of these goals are always competing, okay, in DBT, we, we hold them all uh, up at the same time. However, when we're talking about interpersonal effectiveness, oftentimes when there's a situation that we keep having interpersonal fallout with, we're really having to choose one of those goals. And the skills are meant to address which one of those goals is the priority for us in that moment, okay? So, okay. So, I feel like I lost two. I may have lost a slide where I just want to take a look real quick. Maybe it didn't make it. Ah, that was the stages of treatment. Here we go. Let me just start. Is all yeah. Okay. And Penny, I did have a number of questions that did just pop up. So, um, okay. one was about uh, if you could speak more, a little bit more, and how to regulate. Um, and in other words, I think what they're alluding to is what are the different kinds of things that you can do to help regulate? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yes. And then there's a couple of others, but I'll let you respond to those. Sure, sure. So the idea of emotion regulation, which is kind of at the heart of what DBT is all about, right? So it's a full system response and helping to build skills for emotion regulation. What I would say, first of all, though, just if I was working with if the client in person, right, is that we would be assessing sort of where the intensity of the emotion was at that point. We use a lot of um, scaling zero to five or zero to 10 to kind of observe where the intensity is. Because sometimes when the intensity is too high, right, like so high that you feel like you're having urges to do something impulsive that could cause you a lot of fallout, then we're really going to defer back to distress tolerance skills, which are about being able to practice things immediately for distraction, right? For self-soothing, right? For utilizing tip, which I know, I think you guys have probably talked about. I, I know that it's other, other speakers have talked about that in their different treatments, but tip, you know, being about using temperature, ice, intense exercise, paced breathing, or progressive muscle relaxation. So that's kind of the first way we would go. But if somebody just feels like they are experiencing more of a difficult emotion, right? Like, let's say they are just experiencing, um, you know, anger, it doesn't feel like it's out of control. They feel like the intensity is manageable, but they'd like to get it down, right? They're being intentional about wanting to regulate that intensity. One of the things that we practice, there's a whole lot of emotion regulation skills, but one of the first things is just about being able to observe where the intensity is and making sure that we're checking the facts. Does it kind of, um, is it congruent to what's happening? right? Sort of matching it up with what I'm having trouble tolerating. The other way is that also making a decision that if I want to get it down, that I might start to practice what's called opposite to emotion action, right? So if anger is something that it creates an urge in us to kind of want to maybe uh, fight, right? Or um, for some people, they want to retreat, but or to attack, right? That we are intentionally creating an opposite urge or an opposite action, right? If we feel like we want to get it down and we'll move into what's called like gentle avoidance. Marshall Linehan would say, if you were going to go all the way with opposite action, you would even do something intentional by doing something perhaps kind or nice for the other person. Okay. So again, there are, lots of opportunities for looking at ways to reduce the intensity without making it go away. Okay. Yeah. And so um, another question here, which is uh, if DBT's dropout rate is 50%, can you give examples of the therapy interfering targets you use? Money, time, rapport? Wait, the therapy interfering targets like that's saying that those are the targets, money, time, rapport, or that those are the primary reasons that people drop out. I'm not sure. So if that person wants to clarify if they want to drop that into the 
Q&A or into the chat box for me. And in the meantime, here's a great question that I know you'll want to respond to. Does this work well with personality disorders other than BPD? Yes. Yes. So, uh, and I didn't show you all the slide on RODBT, um, which is also, uh, Thomas Lynch developed that and he worked with Marshall Linehan and it was developed specifically for more anxious over control disorders, but I'll save that for another time, um, is that uh, in DBT, uh, we definitely see uh, a range of other personality disorders, um, particularly in what's called like sort of the cluster B side. So I know it was developed for people with more borderline behavioral patterns, but also we're going to see people that also show narcissistic behavioral patterns, um, antisocial histrionic behavioral patterns. And the reason I'm saying behavioral patterns instead of personality disorder is because oftentimes there can be a lot of crossover between these things. And it's not that somebody has to be in sort of, you know, a static identified personality disorder, but there can be a lot of crossover going on there. We also see people though with, um, you know, uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder and um, uh, dependent personality disorder. So yes, it definitely, it, it, it spans across uh, the thing. Because think about with what personality disorder means. It, it means that there is, it's a man-made, right, words that refer to a pervasive pattern of how somebody responds in their life across time, across settings, right, across people, and it's causing them fallout. And so if somebody that has uh, any type of personality disorder comes to DBT, it's typically because they're, they're, again, their interpersonal world feels really painful. Um, mm -hmm. And so, again, our job is to help observe some of the things, right, that might be causing that. And you're right, which I brought up earlier is that, you know, again, it's not uncommon for people to start treatment and really have no idea about what their own interpersonal targets look like. Okay. So I'm going to give you three more questions because um, we've got about seven minutes left or so. And I want to, you know, make sure that we are honoring your time. I also want to make sure that people know because people often ask us, um, but just if you've not participated in our Mind Matters at Home previously, um, after this, you will be getting an email that will have a link to the recording of this session. So um, if there's anything that you missed or if you want to be able to see this again uh, or share it with someone else, you can do that. Um, so three things. So one is somebody asked about um, how's therapy going in the virtual environment. They'd love to hear about, is, are you feeling like it's the same effectiveness? Um, the other is somebody asked if you could tell a little bit more about the skills training group. So I wanted to make sure you covered that. And then third, sort of along the lines of asking like, how, how does this work with other kinds of situations? Somebody asked about, does DBT um, work well for those who've experienced traumatic child abuse and neglect like um, childhood sexual abuse? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so first in the virtual world. Well, I'm just gonna say to you that as an extrovert, um, I am really missing seeing people in person. So um, I have a bias that I can't wait to be back in person. But let me say this, um, I have been really impressed and wowed with how our team at the intensive outpatient program and how our outpatient practice how we were able to get all of our groups up online when the pandemic came. And they just did an amazing job. And of course, we were all sort of feeling the, the bumps in the road as we were sort of figuring it out, how we were gonna do it in this virtual platform. But honestly, um, aside from, I think the most difficult thing is making sure that people feel like when they're showing up for treatment that they have turn their mind towards like being in the room and having privacy and sort of being able to turn their mind from the day-to-day -day business of living to be in session. Um, other than that, uh, we have really done a great job of being able to continue with teaching the skills and also being able to do a lot of our DBT interventions, if not directly um, in the group on the side, which in real life, we do a lot of our our interventions on the side 
after group as well. And so we've been able to do that in this virtual world because for those of you who may be familiar with the Zoom, they have something called a chat room. And we've been able to utilize that quite strategically to still carry out a lot of our interventions. So yeah, I've been really pleased with it and have to say that um, it, it's been very helpful, especially during this time when I think about clients who have been so isolated and wouldn't have had access um, had we not had this virtual platform. Um, so I hope that answers your question. The other one I think was speaking to what maybe skills training looks like. And I'm sorry, I did, um, I think when my slides went off, I, I had missed some other slides, just kind of talking about the structure of DBT treatment. And so let me talk a little bit about what skills training group looks like. Um, if you're looking at it at the intensive outpatient level of care, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's more of a condensed, I call it like DBT boot camp that is over five weeks and it's three hours a day, four days a week. Okay, but in outpatient, DBT is supposed to last about, give or take about six months, once a week for about an hour and a half. And Marshall Linehan recommends that, honestly, that you do, you do it twice. Um, that's not a mandate, but it is the recommendation. And so what group looks like the structure of group, whether you're an IOP or an outpatient, is that, you know, we start with diary card review, which diary card is something that it's a, it's a way to help uh, self-report and to self-monitor on your targets and emotional intensity and being able to measure urges around target behaviors. We give those to our clients to fill out. And the beginning of treatment is about reviewing your diary card and how you're doing on managing targets. It's also an opportunity to practice homework review. And then we move into teaching the next skill. And honestly, from a DBT perspective, skills training is the priority. So it's like a class. We want you to think about it like a class. It's not a process group. So it's not that people aren't going to have an opportunity to talk because they do, especially during diary card review or like when we're sharing or giving examples during the skills training, but it's not meant to be a process group. It's meant to be a class where the priority at the end of the day is to make sure we're teaching you the skills that we want you to generalize outside of treatment. And I want you to think about that. One of the most common things I hear from people when they're feeling frustrated with treatment is that people can have insight about themselves in a therapy session or on their own. But the frustration for them is that they feel like it doesn't generalize outside of the treatment setting, right? They feel like maybe they're having a wonderful session with their therapist, but it's not really translating into their life. And so DBT is kind of relentless. When I said that it focuses on relentless problem solving, that's exactly what we do. So we're not looking to be right in terms of if a skill doesn't help my patient, I'd say fine, let's look at how you're utilizing it and seeing if maybe there's another one we need to move on to. It's a very pragmatic therapy. So I don't assume that everything is gonna be a good fit, but then we still gotta work on what is gonna be the good fit, what skills are gonna work the most effectively for my, for my client. Um, Okay, I hope that helps. And then the last one, I think PTSD. So yes, um, probably about 75%, and that's a pretty high number, of our patients that come to DBT um, have a trauma history. And so a couple of things. DBT is excellent for helping to manage intrusive PTSD symptoms, right? So like being hijacked by arousal, dissociation, numbing, um, uh, and and being able to you know, increase skills for grounding and being able to, again, practice skills for distress tolerance, particularly self-soothing, right? So that somebody who has a trauma history has the skills and the stabilization they need to be able to do trauma work, especially outpatient trauma work. Because think about that. If you're doing outpatient trauma work, whatever modality you might be utilizing, um, you have to be able to put yourself back together at the end of the session and go home and then come back and do it, you know, the following week. And so, you know, a lot of times that can be really difficult for some of our clients. So we are basically making sure that they have the skills they need 
to be able to do that next in DBT, what we would call stage two. Stage two is where our patients are doing a lot of their trauma work or grief work, but their targets that have been most life interfering are stabilizing. Does that? Thank you, Penny. Yes, you have done such a great job. We're getting some great feedback from folks. This has been wonderful. I am sure we could keep going because I know that there's there's some more questions, but I think largely what I'm seeing is people wanting to learn more. So I'm wondering if one of the things that we might do um, is uh, have you maybe provide us with maybe a list of books or videos or anything that you would recommend in terms of resources where people could learn more on their own? Because I am hearing that, like, what are other DBT resources we can access? What books would you would recommend to learn more about this? So I hear a real hunger to learn more. And so maybe if you can um, provide that to us after we're done today, um, we then can send that out with the link to the video recording as well. So then people have access to that. All right. That sounds great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. A big thank you to Penny. I'm, I know um, we, we had, gosh, almost 100 people that joined us um, today for this. And I know that they're all sitting in their homes or offices or wherever they are, all cheering in thanks to you and your time that you gave us today and all the great information as well. So we want to thank you and we want to thank all of you for joining us. And just a reminder that we will be circling back and doing some Another Mind Matters in early September. Um, we don't have the all the details yet, but we'll get that out to you. And then we will definitely be doing on September 24th is that session on anxiety. So um, thank you again for joining us. And uh, thank you, Penny. Can I say one more thing? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I just want to say thank you to everybody. Sorry about the technical difficulties today, but um, I, I, again, I, I hate not being able to see all of your faces so I can kind of see what you need and if I was able to deliver that. But I do want to say this. Um, uh, I will also provide, you know, my contact information. And if anybody has any questions about DBT and about if it's a good fit for you or your family member, I'm always happy to have that conversation with you um, and help make sure that people get to where they need to go. Thank you so much, Penny. Someone also asked if you would be willing to share a PDF of your slides. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Okay, great. I didn't get to all of them yet. Yes, but that's great. But they had a lot of great information. So um, if you will email those to us as well, then those resources that we mentioned and the slides, then that'll be a great follow up for all the folks that joined us today. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. You guys all stay healthy, be well. We look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye.